Coming up on DTNS, Mozilla helps you pick tech gifts that aren't creepy. Twitter posits its push to inactivate old accounts due to dead people, and cows in Russia make better milk when they wear VR headsets. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, November 27th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. With 12 inches of snow in Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about languages and uh, dialects and Mandarin and pumpkin spice coffee and uh, spoilers. Uh, and that's all on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that wider conversation, in fact, there's going to be an explanation of Sarah's couch building exercise coming up. <laughs> then you got to get Good Day Internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Gardner estimates that smartphone sales worldwide fell 0.4% on the year last quarter, which is the third consecutive quarter of decline, although the smallest decline of the three. Samsung raised its leading market share to 20.4%, as did number two, Huawei, with 17%. Apple's number three market share declined to 10.5%, and Xiaomi dropped slightly to 8.3%. Number five, Oppo, rose slightly to 8%. Well, Valve is in the news again. Valve customizable steam controller is on sale for $5 plus around that much in shipping. So you're going to pay for shipping about as much as you are for the device. Uh, depending on where you live, the sale is clearing out the inventory. And Valve has confirmed that these are the last steam controllers that we've made. The big question is, will they make a sequel or is this it? HP Inc., uh, that's not HP Enterprise. HP Inc. is the one that sells PCs and printers. Announced Q3 revenue rose 0.1% just ending six quarters of quarterly decline. Mm. Uh, sales of PCs kind of built that up. Sales of PCs rose 4% on the year, beating expectations. However, revenue from printers fell 6%. Xerox is attempting to purchase HP Inc., if you haven't heard, announcing a plan to now engage shareholders directly, trying to put some pressure on the HP board to sell. HP projects Q1 2020 earnings per share to be between 53 and 56 cents a share. Apple has changed its maps to show Crimea as part of Russia when viewing Apple Maps in Russia. Outside of Russia, the territories are not shown as part of any country. Russia took Crimea from Ukraine in 2014. Google doesn't show Crimea as part of any country on its maps, but uses Russian spellings of place names when viewed from within Russia. All right, let's talk a little more about what's going on with Facebook and VR. Patrick Beja uh, noted that this news was breaking right at the end of yesterday's show, Scott. Well, we know a little bit more now. Facebook announced it will buy Beat Games. If that name sounds familiar, they are most known for Beat Saber, probably the most popular and very good game uh, out on most VR platforms. Uh, but that means everything, uh, in, including Oculus. So they've got stuff everywhere, which we'll get to in a minute. Anyway, the studio that makes this is now Facebook's P uh, Beat Games will become part of Oculus Studios and continue to operate independently in Prague. Uh, Facebook says Beat Games will not become Oculus exclusive and continue to support VR platforms on its own. However, mods, which let users upload their own audio files, will come under legal scrutiny. That's not a huge surprise given um, they already sort of run up against that with that particular game. Yeah, and if I have this right, the, the mods uh, are just your ability to upload your own audio file so that you can play the game with your own songs. And when this was a small company, a little under the radar, it was easier to be like, mm, no, we, you know, if you tell us something's wrong here, we'll go get it. But if you've got big pocketbooks like Facebook, that attracts the attention of the music industry, which starts to come after you to police that more actively. Yeah, totally, totally accurate. Um, and they, the, the way it worked before, you had to know a little bit about the mods to make them. So if you wanted to put your own EDM music in there or something, and when I say your own, meaning artists that you like, let's say you wanted to put Knife Party in there. I mean, no, it's only uh, Linux ISOs that you're up there. I'm, or, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you go in there and you have to know how to create the beats, quote unquote, the beats, where the objects are, when you got to slice them with your quote unquote lightsabers, uh, all the timing, creating multiple difficulty levels. So the mod scene for that was actually kind of hard. Uh, but now with Facebook owning them, I, I don't think they can get away from uh, away with that. But it's still one of, if not the best experiences in modern VR and I'm personally excited to see what they come up with with a little injection of money. So I, I have really high hopes for this purchase. I think it's going to be good. 
Yeah, I mean, it is an example, and, and they're doing all the right things, saying we're going to leave them independent, we're going to let them do, we, we want to get the best out of them, not ruin them. Uh, and and so, you know, hopefully this this just ends up being a way to make good games that, sure, will feature on Oculus devices, don't, don't get us wrong, I'm sure they're going to use them to make some great Oculus stuff, but continue to make Beat Saber for all the platforms. Uh, yeah. I, I don't ex- see any reason why they wouldn't do that. Yeah, and there's also some precedents, and I, I know VR is not really a platform, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, or there's issues with that being called just a straight platform. But, you know, Microsoft buys developers. They bought Obsidian Entertainment. They just put a game for multiple platforms using Epic's engine. Like, there's a lot of crossover happening right now, which is its own interesting conversation. But this is probably going to be good for both companies. We'll see how it goes. Amazon voice services in the U.S. getting more responsive specifically will be able to respond with excited or disappointed emotional overtones in three different intensities that can be set by developers. So, for example, the feature could be used to sound excited if you tell if it tells you that you answered a trivia question correctly. Maybe disappointed if it's telling you that. Your team lost that football game kind of thing, and so on and so on. The feature is powered by Amazon's neural text-to-speech, and Amazon says user satisfaction at responses increased 30% when the emotions were used in testing. So they think this is a good idea. Amazon also added a speaking style more suited to news in the U.S. and Australia. Yeah, so right now, a lot of these voices are very, like, mildly positive neutral, which right. can be infuriating, right? <laughs> Even though it's supposed to be positive, sometimes that neutral tone to tell you that your team was obliterated 1,000 to nothing can just make you angry. I mean, so- or even something as simple as, sorry, I don't know that one. I yeah. want her to be like, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know that one. Because you're yeah. disappointed too. We're both. Right. Like, so- oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. it's irrational, but it's there, uh, and 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 so this this is a good first start. I mean, it's just two emotional tones uh, at this point, and I'm well, it's I'm three. Getting it's they three. don't. Well, I guess you're right. There's the neutral one too, yeah. uh, but and they're not going to get it right all the time, so that's going to be infuriating occasionally. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll be the, interested this to see the this. Na- it's the natural evolution of how this all goes, right? Uh, there there are certain times where I get a response where I'm like, okay, I know you don't know any better, but that was a little too upbeat for yeah. what I was asking. You're done. Um, you know, and your lottery number is one. <laughs> right. Should yeah. not be the same Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it will rain today. It yeah. is 48 degrees. <laughs> and it will rain today. <laughs> See, I've got a thing right now. I'm a little mad at my Echo because we were trying to get it to play 80s music on a playlist that I have in Apple Music. And the integration is pretty good. And it usually does the commands right. But uh, And this may happen for others, but I would say, please play 80s music on Apple Music. And it would say, playing hot country from Apple Music. And it didn't matter how I said 80s, 1980s, the name of the playlist, rename the playlist, tried it again. Didn't matter. Always modern country every time. So what I would like is when I got so irritated and frustrated is for her to sense how mad I am and to <laughs> try it so that my emotions could be manipulated on the other end. That's what I want. I'm sorry that I couldn't fulfill your request it, it's sort of yeah it's like scott's angry let me recoil yeah and start yeah. to sound a little bit more i'm sorry bottle i'm not getting this right you're obviously upset bottle sure. up those emotions to explode later when skynet happens there you go uh <laughs> moscow's ministry of agriculture and food says research shows a link between a cow's emotional experience and milk yield so to put that to the test uh, to another test, there's been lots of te- research on this, but another test, a herd of cows at the Rus Moloko farm in Moscow's Raminsky district put VR systems adapted to cows' heads on the cows and showed them a lovely summer field simulation program. Initial tests reportedly boosted the overall emotional mood of the herd, and the ministry said, quote, Examples of dairy farms from different countries show that in a calm atmosphere, the quantity and sometimes the quality of milk increases markedly. The effects of the VR headsets on cows will be examined in a long-term study with a potential to expand the project. Mm. You think it's because they don't know? Like, they don't know what this thing on their head is. They just know their senses are being calmed. What if they they do? What if they, like, I mean, cows are pretty docile, right? What if they're like, I like this. This is better. 
Maybe. I mean, that's the thing. They may like it and think it's better, but do they really know what's happening? Or do they you're, know that they're in you're a... You're asking whether that's it's more question. immersive for cows or not, Scott. Yes, that is what I'm getting at. Presence <laughs> is everything in VR. That's what everybody's aiming for all the time, creating real presence. So if you're inching along a cliff wall, you have all of the regular body and mind sensations of, I'm going to fall if I slip. Like, that's the goal. That's the, the you know, the, the holy grail of VR is to, to really capture presence. And I would argue the study shows that the cows have, they created enough presence for the cow to be completely fooled by it. Have and you ever put on a VR headset of like an ocean scene or aquarium? And even though you know it's not real, you just kind of feel yourself calm down? I think that's what's while. going on here. Yeah, once in a while it does happen. I think, and I think it there is some automatic uh, stuff that happens. Like mentally, if I'm in a, a thing where I'm suddenly thrown off something, or if I'm on a roller coaster and there's a drop, you feel those sensations, even though you are kind of aware that your buddy's in a chair over there and you can kind of hear the radio upstairs. And, you know, there's 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 lots of things telling you you're not really in this world, yet we still react that way. I just think cows are just more gullible than us and we'll just buy whatever. I don't know why you're anti-cow, why you got to go either. throwing cows in. I don't either. I like milk. I, I just, I, I don't know. I kind of, I, I imagine you know, a, a row of cows wearing VR headsets and producing, you know, the most milk possible. And I'm like, as long as they're happy, because it can get, this gets a little weird, right? Happy cows come the, from the VR fields of Moscow. Mm -hmm. Moscow. Yeah, right. Even. Yes. Moscow. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's the tagline for sure. Moscow. But, uh, but yeah. You know that uh, rival dairies are now going to start hacking into each other's VR to put pictures of hamburgers in the summer field setting. It's oh, the whole thing. Tom Merritt. <laughs> yeah, it's the rudest thing I've ever heard. Um, in response to Microsoft's Xbox chief, Phil Spencer, calling VR a, quote, isolating experience. This seemed to ruffle a few feathers yesterday. And that, quote, nobody is asking for VR. Sony's Shiwa Yoshida weighed in. He tweeted that, quote, we oftentimes work to make things that no customers are asking for, unquote. Sony's own PlayStation VR headset has sold well over the last uh, little while, 4 million units in total, and uh, certainly have proved that, I don't know, VR might work in a console environment. I would like to point out that Patrick Beja made basically this same statement before Sony got a chance to tweet it when he was talking about Henry Ford's thing about, you know, people don't just thought they wanted faster horses until cars came along, uh, which is kind of what Shuhei Yoshida is, is going for here. Uh, but there were a lot of other people very angry at Phil Spencer for this. Uh, and Scott, I was curious to get your thoughts about, like, was, th was that a mistake for him to say that or does it just kind of make sure to set the table of Xbox is not going to support VR. So just get used to it right now. Well, I think it is important that he, he lays down expectations for this coming generation. Uh, we're all really excited about that new console and all their services that are coming around it. There's a lot to be excited about with Microsoft this time around. I think that it's good to set those expectations, but I do think it's just an argument about semantics at the end of the day. He could have said, um, in our experience and with the numbers we have, we're we're not going to do this right now because the demand isn't there or the man, demand isn't where we want it to be before we really go for it or some other way of saying it to soften the blow. But then again, you're splitting hairs like he basically said that exact same thing in words people don't like. He doesn't mean that nobody wants VR. And in fact, a lot of his context was taken out when people forgot to mention the rest of his statement where he talks about how those experiences are being found in other places, PCs among them, and they have a lot of data on who's using VR helmets on, on PC, uh, Windows Mixed re Reality helmets, that sort of stuff. So they know a lot of that data. And I think that was his way of saying, yeah, we, we know it's out there. We know people want it, but we're at a really early stage of VR. And I think that things need to move down the road a bit before we go for it. And I don't really have a problem with it. In fact, he's the one guy at Microsoft who very rarely gets in this kind of trouble just for some, you know, semantic miss slip or whatever, something he says that he didn't mean or didn't quite get across the way he should have. And so I'm going to let this one pass. I think it's okay once in a while for these guys to flub up and say something in a way that upsets people. But on the other hand, if they said, yes, we're going all in on VR, I'm pretty sure you'd have a whole nother group saying we don't want VR on our console. I didn't get the PlayStation for a version for, for a reason. This better not be standard. So I'm paying more like we'd have all of that argument. So I'm I'm feeling kind of neutral on all this. And yeah. really, what what it seems like Spencer was saying is, listen, this isn't like great for our business model. We just don't have the demand that we thought maybe we would have. But people hear things like, oh, it's isolating. No one wants it to be like, oh, if I like it, then I'm a loner and crappy. 
yeah. you know, it's, it's a very personal, you know, it's, it, it feels like a personal attack. And, and this is, this is something that we've, you know, in technology we see all the time. Yeah, and I would no say strongly quick, worded absolute statement goes unpunished on the internet. That yeah, is true. Right. And I, I, I and we're about out of time for this point, but I just want to make this tiny point. He's one of us. He plays like us. He knows what games are like. And Microsoft is chiefly responsible for a lot of us p playing in a more isolated way. They introduced Xbox Live. It made it so we could play over the internet, put headsets on. I mean, they weren't the first, but the first mass market. And it changed the way we play games. We are kind of isolated as it is. So... I think he's kind of weird. It's kind of weird to say that exactly because we're not all exactly playing couch co-op today is what I'm getting at. But anyway. Drew Olenoff, a uh, former co-worker of mine actually at TechCrunch, penned an op-ed on TechCrunch regarding Twitter's announcement that it would reclaim accounts that have been inactive for at least six months. Olenoff brought up how this would eliminate the accounts of deceased users, including his own father's account. After his and others' concerns, Twitter posted that it will develop a way to memorialize accounts before proceeding with the plan to deactivate. Twitter also further explained why it's doing this, pointing out that the policy was always in place, it just wasn't enforced. Local privacy laws, including the GDPR, have encouraged the company to start enforcing it more than ever. Twitter also said it may have to change its existing policy as well, but will communicate those changes broadly before bringing them into effect. Wow. This was, you know, is it, it, and if you haven't read Drew's piece, it's, it's, it, it's a great example of why you'd be like, this is insane. I can't have this go away. You know, th this person is no longer with us, but I don't have the password. I can't take control of the account. Twitter, you should do something about this. Like it actually means a lot to me. And I know a lot of other people feel the same. Yeah, yeah and it, it was smart of Twitter to, to jump right on this and point out that the reason they're doing this now is because they're trying to comply with privacy laws, like you said, uh, that it doesn't mean they have to do it right this second. And since people have pointed out something they want to take into account, don't worry, we're not going to just start inactivating everyone's account. So it's good to get everyone to settle down. Like, don't worry, Drew Olenoff, your dad's account isn't going away. We're going to come up with a solution and we will communicate that solution. Like, this is actually yeah. pretty good recovery practices from Twitter here to say, we, well, let's explain what we didn't explain correct the first time and let's let you know that we will definitely tell you before we change anything else. Uh, and, and so that is good. What I wonder is, and I, because I can't believe this didn't come up in a product meeting when they were talking about this, why they didn't have this as part of the original plan. Was it something they assumed they would get to later when they revealed more details and underestimated the backlash? Was it something that they just thought, well, I, it's going to suck for some people, but that's just the way it goes. Uh, and now they've changed their mind. I'm, I'm very curious about that part of it. You know, I would guess, and you know, I was not in any of those meetings, but I would guess that this was something that, yeah, the product team was like, we got to deal with this. But once you humanize it, it's like, oh, we have to deal with this now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 that really, even, even if all your intentions are good and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a roadmap of how things are going to roll out. And that's just sort of the way it works with a company, the size of Twitter. When you, when someone says this is pretty bad and here's why, well, you have to change course sometimes. Yeah. It's good to see them do that. I would just add that I, I'm with Tom. I just can't believe this didn't come up. It seems crazy to to say that it didn't, but also I've been around tech long enough and around video games long enough to know that sometimes stuff gets in the wild and you didn't mean it that way or you meant it in a different way or you just got ahead of yourself and the wrong people talked to the wrong people and and you course correct and that's what they're doing. So that's that's good. Yeah, and uh, you know, a Sadly, my my father died before Twitter came along, uh, and, uh, and and I would have loved him to see this. I don't know that he would have used it, but I would have loved him to see it. Uh, and 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 if he had, and I, I want to give Drew Olenoff uh, big credit here, very well crafted piece. This could have been an outrage piece. It could have been angry. It wasn't. It was him very touchingly using his dad's existing tweets to make his point. Yeah. And what I thought was a very elegant and powerful way. And I, I don't know, maybe well, that was part of what, what motivated Twitter. But but this is something that I, I can tell, even though it wouldn't affect me, I would want to have if right. I had those sorts of tweets that Drew has of his father. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you could almost liken this to, and, and yes, my father, uh, who was no longer with us either, d never knew Twitter. But 
He did leave me a couple of voicemails that I will never delete. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't listen to them every day, but they're there and they're very important to me. They Certainly. are sentimental. And if my phone company was like, we're just going to go ahead and blow that out, I would I you know, I'd have a problem with that as well. Yeah, Scott, I, uh, you know, it makes me that makes me think of uh, this recording of my dad giving a, a lecture on evaporated milk uh, that I digitized because I just loved hearing my dad's voice. Mm -hmm. even though I didn't understand half of what he was talking about. Uh, uh, and and so, so, yeah, if uh, if Dropbox said, well, that MP3 doesn't match, uh, we're, we're getting rid of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you haven't yeah. listened to that in six months. Yeah, right. We're going to go ahead and get rid of it. Totally. Well, that that's well, where we're at. We're, these services have only been around, what, 10, 11 years, and we're starting yeah. to experience. Yeah, we're we're having to make rules that just yeah. there were no rules because we didn't do this before. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. they're well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes uh, instead of 30 minutes, why don't you subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com? It's a good supplement for Daily Tech News Show, and you can get all those headlines at DailyTechHeadlines.com. For the second year, Mozilla has published its privacy not included, kind of like batteries not included, privacy not included gift guide, which rates gifts on a scale of not creepy, a little creepy, Somewhat creepy, very creepy, and super creepy. For instance, <laughs> Facebook Portal, super creepy. The Nintendo Switch, not creepy. Mozilla selected the 76 internet-connected products, so everything has a, has a net connection here, based on how popular they are expected to be as gifts. They thought, a lot of people are going to be buying these for each other. Let's help them understand what they're getting into. To determine the creepy rating, Mozilla looked at how a product shares its data, whether you can delete any of the data that it collects on you, if the privacy information from the company is user-friendly, can you understand what the policy is when you look at it, whether it collects biometric data, this is just an important point if, you know, if it's a Fitbit or something, is it going to collect your heart rate, is it going to store your menstrual cycle, all that kind of stuff, and whether it has parental controls or not. Mozilla then looked at whether the gift would use a camera, microphone, or location tracking, and if it did, what permissions were requested and required to make the product work. Separate from the creepy standard, uh, Mozilla also has a minimum security requirements rating. A product can be secure, but also creepy. So for instance, the Amazon Echo Show is listed as super creepy because of Amazon collecting data and listening to it for quality control, but it also meets the minimum security standards. Uh, to meet Mozilla's minimum security requirements, the product needs to use encryption in transit and at rest, support automatic security updates for a reasonable period after sale by default, require strong passwords, uh, and have a system for hand handling vulnerabilities, whether it's a reporting system or a bug bounty program or something like that. And it also has to have a privacy policy. If you don't have a privacy policy, you don't <laughs> the minimum security requirements. So I thought this was a great thing to pass along to people because if you go to mozilla.org slash en slash privacy not included, you can look at these before you buy them because back in the day we used to talk about buying a phone for someone was like buying a burden for them. Before you could get them an unlocked phone, you were buying them a two-year contract on a subsidized phone here in the U.S. And that, that was kind of not a fun gift. So you might want to consider that when you're buying something. Do you, do you want to get them a Facebook portal and, and all the concerns that come with that? Or do you want to get them a Sonos One SL, which is not creepy because the voice activation on the Sonos One SL is just for playing the music and it doesn't collect the data about you. And this is, this is a good resource for looking at that sort of thing. Yeah, the SL, it's funny that you mentioned that, Tom, because I thought that that was, it was one of the best uh, um, uh, Mozilla kind of little, little tidbits where they were like, Sonos did something interesting. They made the Sonos One SL speaker dumb. And that might work for you. You might have a problem with smart speakers, and it does all of these things, but it but it may actually be the best speaker for you because it's not listening the way that other speakers are in that category. Yeah, I've noticed, uh, Sarah, you've been testing and using the Fitbit Versa 2. They have a whole write-up on that in here. Mm -hmm. And they say they've given it five and a half stars. or I'm sorry, four and a half stars, which is just about the full thing. And they and they like it a lot. Uh, they put it sort of in the middle, like not that creepy. But, you know, if you want to use it, you got to share some data. You got to share location data. Like, right. that absolutely meets those minimums. I <clears throat> I really like this. This is awesome. I don't know why this isn't a... 
Well, first of all, I don't know why it's a thing I didn't know about until now. I didn't know they've been doing this for years. So I feel like a big dumb. This is only the second year. Okay. It's an amazing little service to me. It this, really, it's, it's, um, it's very well done. This is like on top of what I get out of something like wire cutter, which I love. Cause that's, you no, know, that's about, you know, how does this hold up? Is it, is it made well, you know, does it do the thing you're supposed to do? Well, I love that kind of thing. This is a great follow on on that to say, all right, well, I've decided to get a home pod. Now tell me how secure it is. And I don't know where else to get this. This is really great. I love it. Yeah. So for instance, uh, you can click through on these and see the star levels for the security standards, as well as what data it collects on you. So I clicked through on the Litter Robot 3 Connect, which is rated somewhat creepy. Uh, it doesn't have a camera, but it does use an app. It doesn't have a microphone. It doesn't track your location, but it you don't know how it handles its privacy. And it's not known if it you can delete any data it collects. So it's not that it does anything. It's that it's not telling you what it does. It doesn't have a friendly privacy policy. It's all legalistic. Uh, so even though it's not a, a device where you're like, oh, it's definitely collecting things on you, it's more about like, we don't really know what this company's doing with your data. Maybe you don't care about that. And that's fine. But you should know that. You should know that whatever data it does collect, you're not going to be able to tell. Yeah, this this description they have, I think this bears reading real quick about Facebook portal it says, let's be honest, Facebook has a pretty terrible track record when it comes to protecting their users privacy it says, remember that record $5 billion fine for privacy failures. Anyway, now they're asking people to drop a couple hundred bucks uh, to put a device with an AI powered smart camera capable of tracking every move and a a word powered. I won't say your name. Uh, listening device in your home. What could go wrong? Given Facebook's terrible track record on privacy, we're worried a lot. I like the honesty. And it doesn't feel like they are beholden to anybody here because nobody's, you know, nobody's doing deals with. Uh, it's very wire cutter esque, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really, really is. is. It's sort of like, listen, we put a lot of thought into this, so you don't necessarily have to. Here's what we think because we really mean it. And we've gone, you know, the extra mile to to give you the recommendations. And you can make your own choice at the end of the day. Mm hmm. Thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. Also making your own choices by submitting stories and voting on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join the conversation that we're having all the time in our Discord. It's a lot of fun. Please join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Andrew wrote in, and he's responding to the conversation we had yesterday about uh, uh, privacy and 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 how you can keep yourself safe when you're shopping for Black Friday or likewise deals. Andrew said, a great service that I've recently started using is privacy.com. They allow you to very easily generate one-time credit cards that expire once they're used. You can pay them to pay subscriptions, use them to pay subscriptions like Netflix, monthly, yearly limits on the amount. There's some options there. Once a card is tied to a merchant, can't be used anywhere else. They have free and paid accounts. I use a Firefox plugin that allows me to generate and fill in temporary credit card numbers with just one click. And I highly recommend the service. Okay. So I responded to him on Patreon uh, because I saw it. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a cool service. Who are they? This is why I like this Mozilla guide. I want to find out who are they and what do they do? Well, the first thing I found on the Better Business Bureau was they have an F rating uh, mm -hmm. because they have 11 complaints and only two of them are closed. Uh, the business is also not Better Business Bureau accredited. So that put up my red flags. I'm like, okay. When I went to their website, they are backed by legitimate VC companies. It's not a scam. Uh, but I have some questions about who they are. What are they doing with my data? Uh, do I trust them with my credit card data? I, I like the service. And to be fair, Andrew said, all I can say is that in my two months of using the service, I've had zero issues either with signing up or using the service, uh, but I haven't had a need to return an item yet. So something to keep in mind. But I do like the idea of it, uh, a, a good trustworthy service that would allow you to make these one-time use uh, credit cards would, would be very helpful for your privacy and, and protecting yourself online. Yeah, actually it kind of feels like a theme today, that Mozilla list, what we talk about with Wirecutter. I like more tools to let me make informed security decisions about what I'm doing. That seems like a really cool way to do it, that F rating is concerning. Well, thanks for the email, Andrew, and thanks to everybody who participates and gives us good uh, little tidbits 
every single day. Also, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Martin James, Bjorn Andre, and Tim Ashman. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. The day before Turkey Day here in the U.S., Scott, what have you been doing over the last week? Well, I had two other turkey days with extended family, so I'm really looking forward to a third tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but here's the here's the trick to that. If you're going to have multiple turkey days, focus on the turkey and less on all the other fat stuff. That's all I'm saying. That's my advice to, from me to you folks. The other advice is this Friday, uh, I'm doing a seven-hour, I keep saying seven, six-hour stream on Friday. <laughs> We're calling it Jack Friday. Why are we calling it that? Because my morning show host, Brian Nibbett and myself, are going to be doing a six-hour stream playing a whole bunch of those Jackbox games. <laughs> so Jackbox, Jackbox collections one through seven or six, wherever we're at now, uh, they turns out those are really fun to do online because you can involve uh, watchers on Twitch and all sorts of people. All they have to do is have a phone or a tablet or a computer somewhere and they can participate in a lot of this stuff. So we are very much looking forward to it. More importantly, it's for charity. We're going to help kids who are stuck in the foster care system and get moved around a ton. Uh, learn more about that at heartcrate.org. But uh, that, those are our partners for this. We're very excited to do a little bit of money raising for some kids in need and having a blast. So check that That's out. That's awesome, this, Scott. It's Good pretty for rad. You. Good yes. for you. I will be tuning in. And it will be fun. That's the other thing. We're just going to have fun and laugh and have a great time. So uh, check it out. There's a link over on the Frog Pants site. or uh, You can find it directly at frogpants.com slash Jack Friday. We want to send you a postcard, uh, but if it's past November 28th, it's too late. If it's not past November 28th, hurry, get your sign up now at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you're already a patron, just stay a patron. That's all you got to do and make sure we have your address. So it's not all you have to do. You also have to make sure we have your address. Patreon.com slash pledges is the easiest way to just go and look and look for DTNS. See if your address shows up there. If it doesn't, you can press edit and add the address. Uh, and if you want to get a postcard with Len Peralta art sent to your home, uh, just become a patron. Patreon.com slash DTNS. We have an email address and that email address is feedback back at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are off for the next two days for the holidays, back on Monday with Chris Mancini from Comedy Film Nerds. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>